Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Or more to the point, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name's John Louth. I'm one of the directors here at VUCI, and it's my privilege on behalf of our Director General, Dr. Karen von Hippel, to welcome you all here this evening. Uh, I must say at the outset that I'm astonished just how young the audience is. We, <laughs> we, we were concerned, but I think it's going to be all right, actually. Uh, what we quite like, if, if you agree, is for this to be a discussion rather than a singular celebration. The celebration it will be in part. So we encourage people to ask some quite challenging questions. Now, I've read the book three times, and it's underlined next to my bed, so I'll certainly be asking a few interesting questions. Uh, the first thing I'll ask, of course, is uh, the Bishop of Slovenia very kindly donated a book to the Rusi Library when he arrived this evening, uh, Unlike the book from Lord Levine, we haven't had one yet, so I, <laughs> I assume that will happen sometime later on today. Uh, just a couple of quick house, uh, housekeeping notices. Uh, no alarms are planned, obviously. If you hear anything, just follow the Rusi staff and we'll uh, gather outside of the building and then come in as soon as we can. Uh, the rules for this evening are very simple. Uh, prepared remarks are on the record question and answers and the discussion very much off the record and I'd be very grateful if people could uh, respect that and also be very grateful if phones could go to silent or if you're my age and above perhaps throw them all away <laughs> that one might be useful. Uh, what we'll do is five to ten minutes of uh, Lord Heseltine and then 20 minutes or so of Lord Levine and then we'll jump straight into the Q&A's looking for a soft landing at about 7.30 and then we can have something more to Eat and drink as you wish. Everyone happy? Yeah. Strapped in? Ready to go? Lord Heseltine, please. I can explain why we're here in very simple um, language. I have a very great admiration for the British Civil Service. I have been privileged to work with them for decades and uh, frequently on the record I have described them as a Rolls Royce, the best engineering in the world. But no driver, no petrol, doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> and that's the job of ministers. And I have seen over my lifetime a growing expansion of the apparatus of political guidance. In my experience, it is of very mixed value. Uh, one of the reasons it's of mixed value is because it creates tribes. And it was hard enough when the politicians had complete control over what was said about them, by whom, to whom, in what circumstance. But as they developed groups of groupies, all of whom had friends, best friends, many of whom were journalists. So the openness of government, which makes government harder, some would say, of course, that's a good thing, uh, but it can be very damaging for those who suffer from the revelations, most of which are speculative and highly self-pleading. So I'm, I'm personally not in favor of what has happened, but with one exception, and that is the opposite of the political advisor the special advisor. And the, my experience of special advisors is really what my place here tonight is all about. It began when I was Secretary of State for the Department of the Environment in 1979. And it was the responsibility, I hesitate over the word privilege, but it was the responsibility of the Secretary of State to accept a six monthly invitation from the house builders who were a pressure group of building large numbers of private sector houses up and down the country. And uh, th they were good at their job, they made money out of it, and they fulfilled the social obligations and political obligations of government. And they mercilessly crucified on six monthly intervals, the Secretary of State over lunch. The lunch was of excellent quality, one of the best hostelries in the country, <laughs> but the persecution was ruthless. 
And of course, there's usually a chief persecutor, and he was called Tom Barron. And whenever these lunches took place, it always ended with a personal uh, confrontation with Tom and me. And I lost every time, <laughs> except the last time, which is, of course, the only one that matters. <laughs> when I said to him, look, you know so much about it. You bloody get off your bottom and come and work for me inside the department, and then we'll see how good your ideas are. To my horror, he accepted. <laughs> and he joined the Department of the Environment as my special advisor, and he was a triumph. He really did help. The civil servants, I believe I'm right in saying, loved him, because uh, although he had direct access to me, he, uh, uh, he never abused that, and he worked constructively, quietly, and um, uh, without leaking to further what, in the end, were what we all wanted. So I was <coughs> extremely pleased about that. There were many things he did. One story I must tell you, which I think is probably untrue, but it's so good a story it has to be told, <laughs> that uh, he followed me, well, I used him when I was in the Ministry of Defense, which I will come to in a minute, um, and uh, I had to build a wall around Molesworth in a night. And the official advice to me is it would take six weeks. And you can imagine that CND would have been at every my, uh, meter of the road lying down if we'd tried to uh, build a fence in six weeks. And so um, I said to Tom, what do you think? He told me what he thought. And he, uh, I paraded him in front of the chief, chiefs of the uh, general staff, the army. And it was a pretty uncomfortable meeting. But he told them what to do, and they did it, and it worked. And then he said to me, of course, that was a triumph, Michael, and uh, the second biggest thing the Royal Engineers ever did. <laughs> oh, I said. And what was the first? Crossing the Rhine in 1944. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you know about that, Tom? Well, <laughs> I was there. <laughs> oh, were you? I said, well, tell me about it. Oh, well, you know, it's, uh, it was an interesting story. We were lined up on the west bank of the Rhine, and uh, Sergeant Major looked at us all. We were all there. We'd had quite a rough time, and we were specialists in our trade, not frontline infantry, but river engineers. Right then, lads, um, line up, please. Step forward, anyone who can swim. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom Barron um, foolishly stepped forward. Right, lads, give him the string. <laughs> and he swam across the Rhine with a string, and the string pulled the rope, which pulled the chain, which pulled the bridges, which led the British Army across the Rhine. I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it shows my faith in special advisors. They're not only good at their job, they are imaginative in the context of selling their engineering skills. So fast forward to... Um, my first day in the Ministry of Defense. Lunch with my private secretary. Tell me, I said, who is the toughest, roughest brigand in the private sector in the defense industries? Oh, he said, there's only one guy, Peter Levine. So I said, fix lunch. <laughs> lunch in Wilson's. I got a problem, I said, young man. I, um, I'm up against the most professional money makers at the expense of this department who love inflation-proofed contracts without too much competition. And you, patronizingly putting my arm around his shoulder, you know all about that. <laughs> now I want you to become a gamekeeper and not a poacher. And that is why I'm here. And that is why anybody has heard of Peter Levine, because he came as my special advisor to the Ministry of Defense. And all the high hopes I had were more than fulfilled. I couldn't have known how the journey would unfold. 
but what a journey it has been. And uh, he generously let me see the texts of his book, which had some rather mundane title, <laughs> until I looked at the title and I said, no, no, no. The title is Send for Levine. Because over the next 20 years, the government of which I was a member, in crisis, always sent for Levine. <laughs> and whether it was the Jubilee Line or whether it was the private sector and the, uh, um, the Canary Wharf, or whether it was beating the hell out of the private sector on their inflation-proof contracts with the Ministry of Defense, or whether it was privatizing the Royal Dockyards, or then working for John Major in a wider capacity, it was always send for Levine. And it has been a great privilege that he now serves on my board of the Haymarket Publishing Group and uh, has been a trustee of my children's trusts and a great personal friend over now decades of public and private life. And so I'm privileged to be here tonight. And I'm only going to move now finally to another special advisor just to sort of fit them into a context of how, how they work. There was a guy, when I went back to the Department of the Environment in 1990, called Tom Burke. And he was a, a lobbyist. And he was a highly dedicated, totally sincere lobbyist in the environmental field. And I was on the back benches, having left Margaret's government. And I wasn't going to be pushed out of politics. I was going to survive. And so I concentrated on the things I knew something about, the European agenda, inner cities, and the environment. And Tom spotted me as someone who had some sort of public voice, because the journalists were quite keen this was a troublemaker. This was someone who was always pushing the boat out, always saying rather uncomfortable things. We could make stories out of him. And so I was rising in public prominence. And Tom spotted this. So he would come to me and he said, Michael, I've been thinking about your environmental career. And I think that what you might think of saying, he would come up with some new line. And I liked it, and it was wise. But what I hadn't realized until later is that he'd been to see the Secretary of State for the Department of the Environment a month before to say to them, him, look, I think the opposition are going to steal a march on you. They're going to come up with this proposal in about a month's time, which, of course, Tom Burke would have fed them as their new initiative. <laughs> and Secretary of State, how you react, perhaps in advance of this <coughs> opposition initiative, is to make this announcement now, which will stymie them. And I then realized, of course, that he had turned it into a tripod of influence. And I was the third leg. He would say, the government is going to do this. The opposition will respond in this way. Why don't you get ahead of all of them and make this announcement? And my reputation in the environmental field knew no bounds. <laughs> so you'll understand why, in the context of my long now political life, the role of the special advisor has been a indispensable part of the march to the upper highlands of power. Thank you. Lord Heseltine, thank you very much for that uh, tour de force. Uh, Lord Levine, please. Stacey, please. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, um, may I first take this opportunity of thanking the remarkable and highly respected institution, which is RUSI, where we're all sitting. I know not a, quite a lot of you have never been here before, but it is an amazing operation, and allowing us to hold this launch in such a historic building. I'm most grateful. Uh, my apologies that we had to postpone the original d launch, but I just had some back surgery and was not in the best of shape to talk to everybody. But if I'd known how so very many old friends would make the effort to come here this evening, I think I might have been persuaded to write another book. <laughs> but thank you all very much for coming, and in particular, I would like to extend the biggest thank you to Lord Heseltine, not just for sparing his valuable time 
in introducing my talk and making so many kind remarks, but much more for launching me in what <coughs> has been a far from conventional career path, as those of you who can be persuaded by my book will learn in far more detail. There's no need for me to extol Michael's credentials to this audience, but I would say to you as one who has had the experience that working for him is both a great adventure and an extraordinary journey. Until the appearance of Michael Hesedon on my scene, the development of my career in defense had been far from conformist. My only experience in uniform <coughs> had been rising to the ranks of staff sergeant in the school CCF. Followed many years later when I was Lord Mayor, I flew to Croatia to join the Royal Logistic Corps as honorary Colonel Commandant at the very end of the Balkans conflict, which was quite a sobering experience. Well, now, the company which I developed would not have merited one line on anybody's list of the defense industry when I joined it back in 1963. <coughs> it consisted of one shop and a warehouse selling MOD surplus binoculars, telescopes, and watches over the counter or by mail order. Well, our sales swelled over time as buyers from the armed forces of various countries found a very inexpensive source of supply. And as time went on, the company became more conservative when it bought up established manufacturing suppliers to the Ministry of Defence, Helio Mirror and Avimo, then moved overseas to set up in Singapore and bought two companies in the United States. The biggest acquisition of all was when we bought Alvis in Coventry. And by that, we attained the designation of a prime contractor, building the Scorpion family of vehicles for the British and several overseas armies. But everything was to change in my life, however, as a result of one phone call in 1984. I'd bought a car which arrived with one of the very first car phones. They were very primitive by today's standards. It worked by picking up the receiver, pressing a button, and then hoping you were within range of an operator who would try to connect your call manually. And one day we were traveling back to London on the M4 after visiting the factory in Taunton. And my PA called to say that I'd been invited to lunch by the Defense Secretary, Michael Hesseltine. Did I want to accept? Well, I did. I, it wasn't often I received lunch invitations from cabinet ministers. So the day dawned and I turned up for lunch well on time at one o'clock. But 1.10 past, 1.20, 1.25, and I was starting to think that maybe it had been a spoof call. <laughs> but by 1.30, sure enough, the cabinet minister arrived, and the rest, as they say, is history. Michael explained that he'd been appointed to the post of Defence Secretary by Margaret Thatcher, taking over from John Knott at the end of the Faulkner's campaign. He had, as he's told you, and as you all well know, very extensive business and political experience, but had rapidly reached the conclusion after having one multi-million pound contract after another piled on his desk, that the MOD was being ripped off and not infrequently. And he asked me if that might be true. And I said, absolutely. <laughs> so at the end of lunch, I thanked him for his very kind invitation and a fascinating conversation. And he said, hold on, I didn't just invite you here for a good lunch. I need you to come and work for me in the MOD. Well, I was rather taken aback, and I explained that that would not be possible as I was chairman of one of the MOD prime contractors. The next day, I learned that Michael Hesseltine doesn't take no for an answer. I was called into his office to meet him, together with the permanent secretary, Clive Whitmore, when in a rather untypical yes minister moment, and having explained, and Clive having explained, that it'd be quite impossible for Mr. Levine to join his office as an advisor Clive was left to work out just how to make it happen as soon as possible. So a task was found for me where there could be no conflict of interest, and shortly afterwards I found myself spending not the one day a week which I promised, but rather four days a week as the newly minted personal advisor with a remit to advise on the future management of the Royal Navy dockyards at Devonport and Rosyth. Well, I'd never been in a Royal Navy dockyard in my life, but I was soon to learn. But first, I had to meet the rather crusty admiral who rejoiced in the title of Chief of Fleet Support. 
who unsurprisingly asked me what on earth I intended to do. I ventured somewhat timidly that the Defence Secretary had asked me to suggest how the dockyards might be made more cost-effective. What the hell does cost-effective mean, he said. And I then realised that this actually was not a phrase in his vocabulary. And when I explained, he retorted, cost-effective my foot, I'm here to fight the Russians, so get out of here. <laughs> anyway, since the time when Samuel Pepys was Secretary of the Navy, the dockyards have been a perennial problem. But thanks to the support of that wonderful man, Admiral Sir John, late to Lord Fieldhouse, I was allowed to work on the issue and by means of one of the first examples of contractorization in government, or GOCO, which means government owned and contractor operated, the dockyards were fundamentally changed for the better through a great deal of hard work and very effective management from the commercial sector. Well, after six months on that job and the dockyards heading in a new direction, I thought I could get back to my real job, but the Defence Secretary had other ideas. He said he wanted me to find out why defence procurement threw out too many cases of long-delayed contracts that were significantly overpriced. So I went to consult the creator of the procurement executive in the Ministry of Defence, Sir Derek, later Lord Rayner, who'd been running Marks and Spencers and had been brought in by Ted Heath. So I returned to Michael with Sir Derek's advice. The defence procurement will never be run properly until a successful business person was put in charge. And Michael said, that's what I thought, you are it. <laughs> or words to that effect. The row that followed was stupendous, led by one or two well-known characters, namely Neil Kinnock and Gordon Brown. But despite their efforts, the die was cast. They certainly threw obstacles into the path. But Michael had a very strong ally in this quest, who was none other than Margaret Thatcher. And when the row reached its peak on a Friday afternoon, and I never knew when I, whether I was going to get there or not, it was in March 1985, and she brandished her handbag and said, and I'm sure Lord Butler, who's sitting over there, will probably remember, she said, this argument has gone on for far too long. I am leaving today for President Chernenko's funeral in Moscow. When I get back on Monday, Mr. Levine will be working in his office. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> and there was, of course, only one answer to that, which was, yes, Prime Minister. <laughs> And so began six action-packed and enormously satisfying years in the Ministry of Defence as the Chief of Defence Procurement, or CDP, to which my name was instantly changed. The obsession with acronyms in the Ministry of Defence, as many people in this room will know, is quite extraordinary. But I soon got used to the idea. In fact, it was really very useful, because I found out if you couldn't remember someone's name, all you had to do was to spell out the initials of their job and they would appear. And actually the habit was quite catching because when I arrived home in the evening, Wendy would call out, oh, CDP's home. <laughs> but starting in a major government department at the top rather than the bottom presented a number of challenges. I was appointed as a permanent secretary grade one. Well, you can't go any higher than that but it unsurprisingly assumes that you know all the rules and the norms. Well, fortunately, Clive Whitmore, one of the wisest of wise permanent secretaries, appointed one of my colleagues as minder advisor. That was my very good friend sitting over there, John, later Sir John Bourne, who was my deputy undersecretary, but an indispensable colleague who soon became a great friend and later was appointed as a very distinguished controller and auditor general. John had to help me to understand the doctrine of annuality imposed by Her Majesty's Treasury. I had a rapid introduction to it when after only a few days, I called in the most senior staff who reported to me and asked them what I thought was a rather pertinent question, having just arrived from running a public company. We were mid-March, just before the government accounting year end on the 5th of April. So the question was, the year's just about to close, so where are we? And there was silence, until one timid voice piped up at the back of the room and said, uh, well, um, 
we do have one problem. And I said, ah, what is that? And he said, well, you see, um, I have to tell you, we're likely to underspend by 500 million pounds. And um, I looked at him and I said, underspend? That's a problem? There's a lot of tut tutting around the room. People say, he really doesn't understand at all, does he? He doesn't understand this. <laughs> and so began my crash course into the wonders of government accounting and a lot of help from an unlikely source. The Permanent Secretary of Her Majesty's Treasury, Sir Peter Middleton at that time, who helped me to inject rather more commercial practice into the way that we conducted our business. But Mike wanted me to try to get to the root cause of the overspending and underperformance on defence contracts. And one unmistakable clause was clear to me, which Michael has just mentioned, and that was the system of what are known as cost plus contracts and the preferred source policy. Cost plus contracts are where the supplier discloses to the department their total costs, to which they then add an agreed rate of profit. But don't you see, I said to them, that means the more cost that the contractor can accumulate, the greater the profit he's going to make. And that's completely crazy. Well, that was the subject of a long battle we fought, but we won. And we got the percentage of those contracts down over a while from over 45% to just over 20%. But I have to add parenthetically, I'm afraid to say, that I believe the number today is over 50%. So there's a lot of work there needs doing. Well, I was then told that some contractors were loath to expose their cost to us. So I asked for the principal offenders to be brought in to see me. When I saw the list, I was very surprised to see the name of Rakel on it. And many people in this room will remember Rakel, which was run by the legendary Ernie Harrison, who was a good friend of mine. So he came in, and I asked him when he was there, while I was surrounded, as usual, by a phalanx of advisors, and he was there on his own. I said, Ernie, is it true that he won't disclose his costs? And he said in his typical way, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so he said, now... You ask all these geezers around here how much of the development costs of our products are paid for by the department. <coughs> well, it turned out the answer was none. Rachel paid for all the development themselves and then set the price by what the market would bear. This, in my mind, was what competition was all about and what we wanted to see. So I turned around to Ernie and said, I'm very sorry we've wasted your time. Please keep up the good work. <laughs> Now, my watchword in the job was competition. And I emphasize this by repeating what Margaret Thatcher had told me when I started. She said, your job is to buy the best possible equipment for the, best, for the British Armed Forces on the best possible terms. P.S. Your job is not to keep the British defense industry in the manner to which it has become accustomed. Do I make myself clear? And of course, there was only one reply to that. One of the highest profile contracts which appeared on my screen was the Nimrod AEW aircraft. This was, believe it or not, a Comet airframe onto which was mounted a GR GC Marconi radar in the, no in the nose. The accumulated cost was rising towards one billion pounds. Now remember this is well over 30 years ago and that was a hell of a lot of money and not one aircraft reaching the specification had been developed. And it was here that the competition doctrine had its full initial effect. To everybody's horror, we cancelled the contract, the huge sunk cost was written off, and the Boeing E3A aircraft purchased instead from Boeing, which has been working happily ever since, and even though it's now coming to the end of its useful life. When I was the CDP, I had, believe it or not, 36,000 people reporting to me. So we worked towards the divestiture of the Royal Ordnance Factories, which now belong to BAE Systems, and the many state-of-the-art research and development establishments, much of which has been transferred to a company called Kinetic. But it's sad to see, however, that two of our best companies with the most successful development capabilities of that time have now disappeared. And I'm referring to GC Marconi and Ferranti. GEC was run by the legendary Lord Arnold Weinstock. Arnold and I fought like cat and dog when I first started. 
But when Arnold saw that the rules of the road had changed, he in turn made GEC change their approach, and we then got on well. But his reign came to an end when his empire was taken over by George Simpson and John Mayo, who invested his legendary cash mountain, which he'd very, very carefully collected, into various very dodgy high-tech ventures, which led to very little, and the share price of GEC plummeted, and Arnold was closeted in a tiny office. I went to see him there, and it reminded me of King Lear. Arnold suffered the additional blow of the death of his son, Simon, and thus came to a very sad end, one of British industry's greatest stars. And the other company was Ferranti. The Ferranti was run by a man called Sir Derek Allen Jones, who had entered into a merger with a US company called International Signal and Control. I knew of this company, and both Clive Whitmore and I warned Derek to be extremely careful. Unfortunately, he ignored us. He was shown to be the victim of a huge fraud. Ferranti folded, and all their shareholders lost all their money. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my apologies if I've been regaling you with the stories of the past, but there is a lot to tell you. It's not all from the defence sector, although in this building you wouldn't expect me to concentrate on anything else. But before I do leave defence, I would like to mention the links that are still there. Ministers and senior officials are sometimes given some remarkable souvenirs. Mostly intangible, I would say. One of mine was, in fact, given to Wendy, who had the enormous privilege of launching one of Her Majesty's Type 23 frigates, HMS Argyle, which she is invited to visit regularly. And whilst being one of the first of its class, now looks likely to be one of the last in service, having just emerged from a major refit. When we went up for the launch, we went with George Younger, Michael's successor, who was a one of the nicest men. And he said to me when we were going, he said, Peter, just remember today, Wendy's launching this ship, you behave like Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> well, as for me, after I'd left the MOD, I was invited to become chairman of the company now known as General Dynamics UK, a subsidiary of the giant US Defence Corporation. They were not only entrusted with the Bowman communication system, which started under my good friend, colleague, and eventual successor, Rob Wormsley, but most recently they won the contract for the new Scout armoured vehicles to be built for the British Army in a brand new factory in, of all places, Merthyr Tydfil. And if you read in today's Financial Times, you will see them say that the, uh, the, the, defense, uh, the British defence vehicle industry is now extinct. Well, I think they may have been fed that by BAE, who lost the contract, but I can assure you it isn't, and it's land living very well in Wales. But let's get back to the story. There came a call in 1992 from the remarkable Lord Butler, sitting here, who was then Cabinet Secretary, who invited me to take over the post of advisor on efficiency and effectiveness of the Prime Minister, John Major which soon became very much into time with working with Michael again when he was appointed as Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I tried hard to steer clear of political labels because through another strand of my career, the election to become Lord Mayor of London was likely. And the office of Lord Mayor is one which has traditionally been apolitical. So when John Major told me that he and Michael were minded to recommend me for a peerage, I said that I was greatly honoured, but I hope he wouldn't be offended if I sat as a crossbencher. And I think I should say, he said, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> but sure enough, in 1998, I was elected as the 671st Lord Mayor of London. It is an extraordinary post and a great honour which both Wendy and I enjoyed enormously. But it would require at least one more book to do it justice. Living in the Mansion House is a unique experience. In the space of a day, you shift from the 21st century to the 18th century and back again, several times in the same 14-hour period. Well, I was able to put my political neutrality to the test uh, when the government changed, and I was invited by John Prescott, who was also, as you may remember, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, to advise on the completion of the Jubilee Line in time for the millennium, as I'd had a 
slight reputation built up having sorted out the Docklands Light Railway. And that was an interesting experience, uh, and the line was finished just in time, just like on the 29th of December, 1999. <laughs> and then closer to home, I suddenly found myself in 2010, recalled my old stamping ground right at the back of us, at the back of this building, in the Ministry of Defence itself, no less, to chair the Defence Reform Group at the request of the then Defence Secretary, Liam Fox, who, of course, now has other problems on his hands. I think that achieves some good. And if you speak to some of the people in the MOD or the armed forces today, you may just find that the word Levine has become an adjective. Uh, I, I, I will say no more. But I'm pleased to say there have been other strands of my career, not all linked to defence, but linked inevitably to Michael Heseltine, especially when he returned to government, first as Secretary of State for the Environment, then Secretary of State for Industry and President of the Board of Trade, where the nickname Preza came from, and then, as I mentioned, as Deputy Prime Minister and First Secretary of State. And then I had my appointment as Chairman of the Docklands Light Railway, which I was able to revive by the introduction of my most able colleagues from the MOD, led by Major General Malcolm Hutchinson, my former Private Secretary Stephen French, and my former colleague in United Scientific, Anthony Jackson. Then the DLR was there to serve primarily the extraordinary new development of Canary Wharf, for which I suddenly found myself responsible in 1993, and which is now run by one of the most brilliant and hard-working men with whom I've ever had the privilege of working, Sir George Akabescu. George has done an extraordinary job of building Canary Wharf into the working home today of more than 120,000 people. When I started there, we had 5,000, and it's still growing. In parallel, I have been trying to pursue a career in the financial city and have served at the US investment bank was Steen Barella, then Morgan Stanley, followed by the chairmanship of Bankers Trust International, which suddenly, without anybody noticing, turned into Deutsche Bank, which was a bit of a surprise. But then, as suddenly as the MOD had appeared on the horizon in 1984, so appeared in 2002 the world's leading insurance market in the shape of the chairmanship of Lloyd's of London, or to give it its correct name, simply Lloyd's. That was a post which I held for nine years, and one that was very fulfilling, because like Canary Wharf, like the Docklands Light Railway, this was an institution which had been through a very rough time and needed to be reinstated in the eyes of the world. But we succeeded, and it regained its historic place, I'm very happy to say, as the leader in the world of insurance. And without wishing to create too much confusion, I then started up a new venture in 2011, whose goal was to become a new challenger bank on the high street. And we were bidding for the 627 of Lloyd's Bank, absolutely no connection, you know, with Lloyd's. And the new venture was known mysteriously as NBNK. But Lloyd's Bank decided to sell to another bidder, you may remember the story, uh, the Co-op Bank, chaired by a man who became known as the Crystal Methodist. <laughs> and that, I have to say, all ended in tears. And at the end of the day, the branches were sold by a uh, branch of Lloyd's known as TSB. They sold, sold it to a Spanish bank Banco's Banco Sabadell. That bank then got in the most terrible trouble and have just had to pay out about £900 million to their customers for fouling up their RT, that IT system. And that is an ongoing tale. There is another report coming out. You never know. So finally, I now spend my time on the board of Star Insurance on, in the City of London, on the board of Eurotunnel, a hugely successful business notwithstanding the tribulations of Brexit and the fact that the government will never tell us what they're going to do, on the board of the China Construction Bank Asia in Hong Kong, back to Defence, chairing General Dynamics UK, as chairman of the London office of Tikaho, the fund manager, and last but not least on the board of Haymarket Publications, Michael's publishing empire. But then perhaps that's where we started. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening so patiently. And if I can answer any questions later, I'll be happy to try to do so. Thank you. Thank you.